Chris Mills. Good morning. Okay. Today I want to share with you some lessons that we've learned with RTM in Tanzania, both in storage monitoring as well as transportation. So let's start with something you probably all know, uh, which is that the journey that a vaccine takes from manufacturing to administration is an intricate one. Along the way, it passes through several storage facilities and many transportation routes. And failure at any point in that journey, be it power outage or equipment malfunction or process mistake, can compromise the potency of vaccines and render them less effective. That's why end-to-end -end visibility can be so valuable. It allows staff responsible at all levels to respond to risks when and where they show up. So today we're gonna to look at some lessons that we've learned about managing RTM at scale in facilities, as well as some of the stuff we've learned in our new transportation monitoring pilot. So quick history, in Tanzania, they've been using RTMDs since 2014. Uh, initially, these were deployed at central, regional, and a few district stores. And since then, they've expanded to about 5,000 devices at every district store and many health facilities. RTMDs provide visibility into CCE performance and draw attention to it when it matters, right? Uh, Real-time SMS alerts allow health workers to respond to temperature excursions uh, and act appropriately. And then the data collected by RTMs can be aggregated and analyzed to empower decision makers at all levels to make decisions that improve cold chain performance. So here's a real world example of that kind of alert plus visibility leading to coordinated action. Uh, on January tw or July 20th, a health facility worker in Tanzania got an alert that the temperature was too high uh, in a fridge that was being monitored by an RTM. So they called their Devo and together they troubleshoot you know, what they think that the problem might be. Uh, so they tried a few things. They tried making sure the CCE was clean, that it had proper ventilation, and over the next few days, the Devo monitored the performance of that fridge in the RTM dashboard remotely. They saw that performance wasn't improving, so the Devo uh, planned a trip out to that facility. And in this case, they had some experience with this type of malfunction with this particular piece of equipment. So they brought along a spare part that you know, they thought might be the cause. You know, when they got there, they diagnosed the issue. They replaced that faulty component. Uh, it was a heater element in this case. Um, and then the temperatures return back to normal. So that's kind of the, the benefit of RTM. You know, both the health worker and the Devo are looking at the same set of data. The Devo is able to kind of help diagnose remotely, troubleshoot what might be going on, uh, and then plan some action very quickly about, you know, what, what could help remedy the situation. But when you scale that up to a country, uh, there are lots of challenges that emerge. Probably the biggest one that we've learned is network connectivity. So um, with one, two RTM devices in urban areas, you may not notice this, but when you scale to 5,000 devices across the country, you really start to feel the pain of having so many different network providers with different SIM cards, different ways of topping up those SIM cards. Um, and, and speaking of topping up those SIM cards, that was another uh, challenge that we observed, which was the process for topping up data bundles for SIM cards wasn't very clear. So it wasn't clear who should be responsible for topping up RTM data or, or what would happen if they didn't do that. Uh, also, in Tanzania, we saw new CCEs that had built-in RTMDs uh, become installed, and that led to the removal of existing RTM. Uh, that's okay. But the problem in this case was that the new RTMDs weren't integrated with VIMS or with the other data from other RTMs. Uh, and so it led to sort of a fracturing of data. It meant that you couldn't look at um, one place for, for all these fridges. You had to remember, oh, that fridge is in a different place and, and look over there. And that caused some friction. Uh, also something I'm sure many of you are familiar with, high staff turnover in facilities uh, was a challenge. So, you know, you invest a lot of resources into training staff on how to use RTM, the benefits of RTM, and then staff turnover means that uh, sometimes simple 
troubleshooting procedures such as, um, you know, we had an RTM device that was offline for a long time and when someone finally made the, the visit to go and investigate, it turned out to just be unplugged. Um, and that was because the, the health workers in those facilities hadn't been trained on what RTM was. They didn't know what it was, so they didn't realize that unplugging it was going to cause a problem. Also, when you get to this kind of country scale, you'll begin to notice RTM device issues, uh, similar to like fridge maintenance, um, things like defective sensors, um, chargers or batteries that are worn out and need to be replaced. So thinking through the, the maintenance procedures and policies around RTM is also beneficial. Uh, so here are some of the ways that Tanzania adapted to those challenges. Um, there was an increased coordination between the ministry and the president's office and community health teams to help um, in diagnose RTM at the appropriate level. So uh, that helped more rapid response happen when devices were offline or were out of data. Um, instead of having like a large scale coordination, they were able to sort of triage those issues you know, at the appropriate level. Uh, we also saw a lot of peer-to-peer -peer learning emerge through WhatsApp, which was pretty cool to see. Uh, so there are several groups that devos and health workers and biomeds and cold chain technicians would join, and they would use that to ask questions or share knowledge that they had about RTM, uh, help troubleshoot issues when they popped up, uh, help look at data and ask like, hey, what does this mean? Um, so that kind of like peer-to-peer -peer learning helped um, sharpen the skills of troubleshooting and just lead to more long-term retention as they had high staff turnover. Tanzania also shifted a lot of uh, training out of the classroom and into the health facility to give health workers hands-on experience with RTM setup, installation, uh, usage, and this like real-world experience helped them you know, sharpen their troubleshooting skills and data usage skills at the facility level. Finally, global SIMs played a huge role in addressing the challenges of network connectivity. So global SIMs allow one SIM card to be installed into the device and automatically select the appropriate network um, you know, based on signal strength and greatly simplify the data bundle management, the payment. Um, so that switching to global SIMs led to a, a huge reduction in network related issues that we observed. Okay, that's storage. So now let's talk about transportation. Um, keep in mind that while monitoring at the storage level is mandated in Tanzania, it, it's not required for transportation. Um, so in partnership with InSupply Health and the Tanzania Ministry of Health, you know, Nextleaf piloted a cold trace monitoring solution, uh, which is an RTM designed to um, monitor transportation trips. And these kinds of like RTMs designed for transportation contexts can help fill that gap uh, in the knowledge of the cold chain. So, you know, we know what's happening at the facilities, but knowing what happens during transportation can aid in protecting vaccines. So in this pilot, um, Revos and Devos were trained on how to use the device, how to use the application that went with it, and 10 districts in Mwanza and Gaeta were selected. Uh, those districts were picked based on um, trying to find a good mix of urban and rural areas, as well as some hard to reach facilities, just to sort of get a representative sample of what transportations might look at, look like. Okay, there's a lot of data from this study. I'm gonna to try to give you the highlights. Um, during this time, we monitored the trips, uh, 146 trips over 9,000 kilometers, totaling over 500 hours. So a ton of transportation. In all of these trips that we observed, of those, 82% experienced some type of excursion, either heat, cold, or both. 26 trips uh, had only cold excursions, of which four rose to the level of like a WHO freeze alarm. So, you know, being below zero C for an hour or more. There were 64 trips that experienced only heat excursions, and the average duration of a heat excursion was about one hour, 56 minutes although several had durations into the three to six hour range as well. So note that we didn't observe any trips that were longer than 10 hours, so it wouldn't have been possible to register a heat alarm by the WHO standards, um, but heat damage being cumulative, even these like kind of small excursions can add up over time. So here's a, an example trip uh, from that data set. You can see that it lasted about six hours uh, in total, and it made multiple stops along the way. The map on the right shows 
you know, kind of the, the direction of the trip, where they stopped, and the temperature during that journey. There were two excursions on this trip, um, both a cold and heat excursion. And you can see that on the temperature trace, as well as an annotation about when an alert was sent to the driver. In both cases, the uh, excursion was able to be corrected and you know, brought the temperatures back into the safe range. So uh, this data was used in a variety of ways uh, in the ministry. First, you know, um, it helped the ministry re-examine their SOPs around packing vaccines for transportation. So they revisited the, the best practices, how they're going to store vaccines, how they're going to load them in the trucks. Uh, it also really helped district and, and regional vaccine officers rethink their distribution planning. Um, so we saw uh, plans for fewer trips, um, trips that were shorter in length, fewer stops along the way. Um, we saw trips that were planned earlier in the morning where it's cooler outside and uh, increased requests for closed top vehicles you know, to protect the cold boxes from the sun. So all of those things together helped um, avoid additional excursions during transportation. Thank you. Thank you for that super practical. I love the, the practical actions that were taken out of that. Soli, come on down. Thank you. And yeah, it's unfortunate I'm standing here to present the slide of Dr. Amilo from Senegal. She was planning to come here and share her experience in using our solution in, in Senegal. And unfortunately, she couldn't have a visa. So I will do my level best to try <laughs> to render the presentation as she wanted it to be. So uh, this is a. Uh, Temperature monitoring in the vaccine supply chain is one of the evaluation criteria for the effective vaccine management. And uh, remote temperature monitoring is uh, used to, for us best practices for vaccine storage and transportation at all level of the vaccine supply chain. You know, during storage from national level up to the last mile and also during transportation. And the availability of real-time data enables effective and sweet action that needed to be taken to reduce vaccine losses and optimize the cold chain utilization. So in Senegal, working with Gavi and other partners, uh, we have introduced a solution manufactured by Parcel, which is the company I work for. And it's, uh, intended to, it's an innovation solution that came from the infuse program, and we the, we started by doing a small pilot <clears throat> in some few facilities, and as we learn, we improve our, our product and working with the Senegalese government, and now we brought it up to scale, during for all the vaccine storage facilities across the country, and also during transport at all level, or the supply chain. So just a background on how the Senegal Senegal supply chain is organized, Senegal is one of the African countries, for those that don't know, in West Africa. It uh, has 14 region, uh, regional directories. They're having a central location in Dakar, like many countries do, where they store, they receive vaccines, uh, you know, and they store it there. But in addition to that, they're having uh, about 14 regional health directories. Each of them is having a regional store and 79 health districts. In addition to that, they're having about 19 157 public and private facilities that they are covering, meaning that all vaccine distribution in all of these facilities is the responsibility of the ministry. And the way the supply chain is organized is they are having a mixture of push and pull model. A push model from the national level up to the region. It happens usually on a quarterly basis. And uh, where they're having big trucks that are taking the vaccine from the national level from Dakar, traveling across the country to distribute. And the pool model is from the region to the district and the district to the health facility, meaning that people from the region, to, from the district have to come to the region to collect the vaccine, usually on a monthly basis. And people from the health facility are also doing the same, going to the district, collecting vaccines 
on average on a monthly basis. This is during the routine immunization. But when there's campaign, things can change. You know, during campaign, vaccine can bypass, like uh, the, they can go from the national level directly to the safe delivery points. So, so the reason that Senegal adopted our solution is really to improve the storage and transportation condition of the EPI managed vaccines in Senegal at all levels, you know, from national level up to the last mile, including also outreach session, storage and transportation monitoring. So the specific objective of that, if we can call it project, is to determine the extent and condition under which temperature variation occurs throughout the supply chain. If you don't measure, you don't know. So this is like uh, shading some light into the vaccine supply chain just to ascertain the quality and what challenges may happen as far as temperature excursions is occurring during the supply chain for the entire supply chain. And the second one is really use that as an opportunity to evaluate the performance of the equipment used to store vaccines and in order to strengthen the supply chains, the cold chain in the country. The third one is really develop a greater awareness among supply chain actors regarding the sensitivity of vaccines to temperature during storage, storage and transportation. Because when you start collecting data, you can show people how they can improve and pay attention, be careful about the way they are managing the vaccine supply chain. And lastly, it's really evaluate the current practices and if necessary, like uh, uh, my colleague talked about in, in the case of Tanzania, improve and update the national guidelines <coughs> to strengthen the supply chain by changing policies and SOPs. Yes. So the way they are doing, I think I'm going to focus in my presentation more on like the systems that have been put in place. So they, uh, when they started establishing the, uh, using our solution across the country, you know, they are having what they call like a national level working group. You know, that's the national level working group that's really responsible for like decision making policies. It's, it includes like uh, some of the partners also, development partners at the national level. At the regional level, they're having what they call ECRs that meet regularly. It's uh, under the auspices or what they call the Direction Regional Blast So they do convene some regular meeting to review some of the issues related pertaining to vaccinations and vaccine supply chain. At the district level, which is the last level where they are convening meetings on a monthly basis, uh, they do review data, vaccine usage, vaccine, like some of the report that they have to do on a monthly basis, and that includes also reviewing the temperature data. And the, this project also, allowed people really to build the capacity of people at the national level, the EPI team at the national level, at the regional level, district level, and also at the service delivery points, you know, nurses, nurses assistants, and, and storekeepers. It's uh, important to mention here that our model is we go to country, train people at national level because our solution is easy to use, and they have the responsibility to go to the regional level, train people at the regional level, and, and deploy the solution, and, the regional level also goes to the district level, train them, and they'll deploy it. And the district level people also are responsible of deploying it and training people at the service delivery point. For as far as transport is concerned, they are also using uh, uh, our, our solution to monitor transport uh, in, at all level during the regional distribution and during distribution from the, national, the regional level to the district and so on and so forth to the health facilities and delivery point. And also very importantly, they're using also for outreach, during outreach session. And this project have not been, wouldn't have been possible without the support from Gavi. First for um, uh, introducing us to Senegal and providing funding to his deployment. But in addition to Gavi, we got some funding, financial support from the US Department of State, okay, and the Health Development Committees, WHO, and UNICEF. So, and uh, the, our information system, similar to uh, what my colleague mentioned in the experience that they had in Tanzania, we're having a mobile app, we're having uh, where people can use and interact with the device via Bluetooth, we're having a web app. And we are having like a monthly report 
that the district committee are reviewing. It has been routinized now. So every month when the district committee meets, they review the data from the specific district and take the necessary action. Let's say that the healthcare worker is on a daily basis. They see alarms via SMS, and then they can take the necessary action to save the vaccines. And the ministry in Senegal, they have now a monthly newsletter that they do the national report included in the national the monthly newsletter that goes to all the regions and uh, district coordinators. Now, for the evaluation, because it was a project, so it has been undergoing like routine evaluation, so at national level and at the regional level and the district level. So they do continuously monitor the performance of not only our solution, but also the cold chain. So uh, I think that uh, very quickly, remote temperature monitoring has been installed in Senegal across 1,847 health facilities. Uh, all the 79 districts and all the region and at the national level. It has been easy for them to integrate it into the routine EPI processes. And uh, it has changed positively the behavior of some agents. This is something very funny because when people realize that they're having a device, they are feeling that they're being monitored, they are being watched. So I think that they're changing their behavior. So even without a solution, you know, they are able to change how they store how they transport the vaccines. And uh, all the temperature data from the country, uh, yeah, this is has positive and negative, is in one, is, uh, one database in one place. Our platform effectively have all the data for the whole country. And from the perspective of Dr. Lo, this using this solution has reduced the losses of closed vials in, in Senegal. Okay, and maybe if she was here, she could quantify that. <laughs> Again. So, but we need, uh, we, we face some challenges. If it's similar to the experience in Tanzania, I think that uh, having connectivity was an issue of deploying a remote temperature monitoring. And the first generation devices also had some challenges, but we were able to work with them and improve it and harden it. And during the pandemic, unfortunately, some of the activity, routine activity that they were conducting couldn't be done because they couldn't do it, they couldn't travel. And the solution, they have like some issues also with uh, some of the uh, robustness of some of the equipment. And for monitoring the transport, it's starting. It's not a routine habit everywhere. So this is something that they're working on. And uh, yeah, sorry, the last one is during the, 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 the Ministry of Health workers, were on strike, and then some of them were, you know, unplugging the remote temperature monitoring as a way of pressurizing the government to <laughs> resolve their problem. So this is something that happened in Senegal. So yeah, I don't know. So yeah, vision for this future is really equip most all the health posts with uh, our passport, and we are discussing like interoperability and integration between our system, the logistic management system, and DHIS2. Sorry, I went over time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zoe. I think this is a great experience that is also very relevant to Tanzania. And now on to Kenya with Yasmin. Oops. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to take everyone back across the continent to East Africa. Just want to acknowledge my colleague Amos, who is in the room and was a key part of this work that I'm about to present on today. Um, okay, so let's start a little bit by talking about the challenge we were trying to solve. And I think one thing to point out is we've just heard two presentations where ministries of health were fortunate for the most part to have data and systems aggregated um, through one, you know, Nextleaf in Tanzania and Parcel in Senegal. Kenya is a very different context. We have a situation where it's a div highly devolved country, 47 different counties, and the, the, the ecosystem is fragmented when it comes to devices around CCE. So it, the three sort of major challenges we were facing were, um, and, and sorry, I should have said, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is much more on the data use side rather than the device 
itself side. Um, and so with data use, obviously you need data, and the purpose was to look at CCE performance improvements. But we were hampered by three major barriers. The first is limited data capture and visibility of temperature data. Um, the second, meaning that there wasn't remote temperature devices across the system. The second is this lack of standard analytics. And so even where you did have data, each device manufacturer presented that data in a different way. So when you're talking about trying to standardize the use of data, that's very complicated for managers at different levels of the system. And the third one was fragmented dashboards. So even at the national level, if a manager wanted to look at the performance, they would have to log into four or five different dashboards to try and understand there was no way to see all the data in one place. So in partnership with the Ministry of Health, both at the national and the county level, um, and New Horizons, you'll hear from Brian and his team next, our goal was to improve and standardize um, vaccine cold ch chain temperature monitoring processes and increase data use to inform operations, actions, and decisions at all levels. So we used four approaches, um, and we piloted this in three Kenya counties. Um, the first is human-centered design, both to understand the pain points as well as to really understand at each different level of the system, sub-county, which is like district, county, um, which is more province or region, and national. Um, what are the decisions that people need to make and how can the data be visualized in a way that informs not only decision-making but root cause analysis of some of that. The second one was VARO, and VARO, you'll hear about more from Brian. This is an app that essentially, in, in Kenya, the context is that all facilities have, for the most part, FT2Es at, in the devices at the facility, in the fridges, um, and an FT2E does not send data remotely. So it's 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 stuck there at the facility. And our challenge was, given the lack of sort of... Um, leadership or initiative in Kenya trying to standardize remote temperature monitoring devices across the board. How else could we standardize and get access to increased data? And um, FT2Es was a logical choice. Uh, Brian will talk about VARO and how that's possible. It's essentially a simple OTG cable that gets plugged into the device, into the health worker's phone, and transmission of the data is very easy. So we worked with Varo, and then we worked with Poco DV, which is a dashboard that actually allows data to be pulled in from multiple different devices. Um, and it, we worked with the Ministry of Health. They standardized what they felt were the most important KPIs. And... Uh, and we used our human-centered design process to actually visualize the data from um, these devices. So VARO data, FT2E data, and um, one other device was pulled into PogoDB. And PogoDB uh, is, is also available by the New Horizons team. We worked with them for that, device, for that dashboard. And finally, what we call impact teams, and I'll talk about that next, which is a team approach to data use. So impact teams are a system of interconnected teams, which means in an ideal scenario, we set them up at different levels, levels of the system, and they're made up of multidisciplinary um, team members. So in, in this scenario, they have EPI nurses, they also had the technicians, they have pharmacists, they have data people who are within the system. And um, all of these people meet routinely. They're trained to identify key KPIs that they want to focus on, set targets for that, and use action-oriented dashboards. And this is where PogoDB came in. So we, um, we, we, we train them to facilitate a structured problem-solving process. They identify first which are the problematic indicators they would like to focus on, what's the root cause of some of these issues, and then what to do about it. And having that multidisciplinary team is really helpful for very creative problem-solving sometimes. Um, and then they're empowered to take that action. And the cycle repeats itself every month. And this is how we begin to see improvements. So we, we had some existing teams already, and we chose three counties that were very different from each other. One, Nairobi County, it's actually very diverse and huge. Um, another one was Mombasa, the other one was um, Turkana, and we chose them for 
their their geogra- you know they're very hot very different conditions different connectivity we were trying to understand could this work across a range of of context and situations. So we worked with 17 teams across 26 sub-counties in three counties and provided sort of intensive project support and then transition support. Um, What we try and do is is design solutions for scale and sustainability from the start. And so as part of the design, and this is where the HCD comes in and the partnership, as part of the design and implementation, it was important for us to demonstrate to the ministry that this could sort of be scaled without um, in supply or any other partner in the lead. And and sorry, what I should have said is we worked with 300, over 300 facilities, and that's where the data from VARA was coming from. So um, w- one of our philosophies is that uh, if for any kind of technology or data, you have to look at people and process as well. And that's, um, that's sort of the mantra for how we do uh, data use approaches. As you can see from, from the results, the, the graph starts obviously at the start of the intervention. We didn't have data before, so we can't show you before data. It's just during and after. And the the two dotted lines in the middle is the transition period from when we started handing over to the ministries. Um, the handover was complete by the end of 2021. The data post the second line is um, current data where InSupply has not been involved at all. And so what you can see is it it was very successful, especially during the project period. Um, The most mature county, Nairobi, had above 85% reporting rates consistently. And even afterwards, they've managed to maintain above 60%. And actually, one of the reasons the reporting rates have dropped is, I'll talk about it a bit, is the expiry of the FT2 devices, not necessarily that the people stopped doing what they were supposed to do. Takana had the lowest reporting rates, but Takana faces significant constraints. They were chosen um, intentionally because we knew that if something worked in Takana, it could actually work in most hard to reach areas in Kenya because of the constraints around human resources, security, connectivity. And so as you can see, it it worked. Um, Even now, it's sort of working. We suspect that sharp dip is because of significant expiries, but also because of the fact that the routine aspect of data use is difficult for them to implement. Um, This is uh, data from Nairobi specifically, and it's just showing you that the height of the red bar on the left is the high reporting rates. Towards the end, these represent FT2 e-devices that have expired or are damaged, and so the reporting rates have dropped. But as you can see, there is a significant drop in um, the alarms over time. That's the blue line. And you can see with this data use process, um, those alarms reduced because of the actions taken by users. And on the right-hand side, you could see uptime was really high consistently, um, and it's just the reporting rates because of the FT2 that have gone down. So we were partially successful, I would say, in that we improved capture and end-to-end visibility with a very affordable mechanism. So we did not pay for any airtime. The And I think this is really important to point out. The, the investment around Varo, I think it's a free app. The OTG cable is the only one. Once the health workers, it costs less than a shilling, which is, I think, zero, it's one cent, one US dollar cent. So it's very, very affordable to send that data. And health workers um, made a commitment to do this and they did it without any support from the project. Um, Just to say, I know I'm running out of time, the private sector, this is, we have WhatsApp groups for each, associated with each of these impact teams, which really helped with peer-to-peer learning. It helped with taking those actions. It helped with reminders of reporting. But also private sector was part of, private sector providers were part of these, and they got so excited by um, what they were seeing with their public sector counterparts, they decided on their own to buy the OTG cables and use VARO for their own temperature monitoring. Um, And just to say that the Ministry of Health would not have been able to identify uh, the expiries of FT2Es without this process. There was no mechanism for them to know that thousands of these had expired. And since then, um, and I would say this is another success, they have... Um, it procured entire the new batch of FT2Es for the whole country, and they're making the decision to scale up VARO and the use of OTG cables because they've seen such a benefit at the county and national level to having that data available and used. 
Um, some Very quickly, some of the challenges, staff turnover continues to be a high one. We used a cascade method of training, so the sub-counties could onboard new ones. Um, and of course, the expired and broken down FT2Es. Um, our big challenge that still remains is that the data is still dispersed in multiple dashboards. So even though VARO is central, uh, the FT2, the facility data is centralized, when you go up the system to sub county, county, and national, you've got a um, fragmented a fragmentation of devices, and that data is not captured centrally. The ministry does have plans for this, though, which is really exciting. And looking ahead, I think it's really just trying to standardize where the data is available and how it's available so that we can standardize the use of data for decisions. And secondly, um, really looking ahead now, once you have that process, how do you use this data to predict CCE uh, maintenance needs and help sub-county and county managers plan for those? Thank you. Thank you, Yasmin. And some great uh, practical lessons learned again from, from Kenya. And now we're taking to the future, Brian. Take us to the future. Where are we going with this? Thanks, Wendy. Now, I'd like to talk today about how we integrate that CCE data that Yasmin I uh, was just talking about that is available in many sources right now, but isn't commonly available in a common location for countries to extract the maximum value out of it. So as we've been hearing over the past couple of days, there's lots of great stories about how cold chain data <clears throat> is being used to drive action. But how can we get more of that? How can we ha have that happen across programs and across countries? One of the limiting factors that we've seen is exactly what Yasmin was just describing where in many countries there are numerous data systems, each that provide a fantastic picture of a subset of equipment, but EPI logisticians or EPI personnel have to paint that complete picture of cold chain data by looking at each of those individual platforms and assembling a picture manually. Clearly CCE data are going to be most useful if they can be integrated together into some common locations for review. And it's not just about putting an entire picture of the cold chain together, it's also important for that picture of the cold chain to be in the context of the rest of the EPI program. We've seen some nice examples from countries where when the, bio, the uh, biomeds and the CCE engineers could see how the performance of the cold chain was affecting the service delivery functions, they had a much better picture of where to prioritize action and how the performance of the cold chain was really impacting the rest of the system. So this need for better data integration has come up again and again and again. I think we've heard a number of references to it throughout different sessions at this conference alone. And a pattern is starting to emerge of how this could be addressed. This is absolutely a tractable problem. And I'd like to present a brief roadmap of how we might get there in this presentation. Just a quick background about our organization and our role in this. We are a USA-based nonprofit organization addressing technical gaps, particularly where there isn't a business case for commercial suppliers to address those gaps. An example is the app that Yasmin was just talking about, Borrow where we recognized that 30 DTRs were widely deployed across the cold chain, but there wasn't a great way to access data from those and move those to peers or into the health system. So we developed this app. Uh, it's being used now in a number of settings. And particularly, we don't receive any data from this app. Uh, users decide who to send the information to, whether it be the health system or their peers. So that is well aligned with country data sovereignty. So as we talk about solutions here, if I could leave one message with you all, it's that any solution has to work for all of the stakeholder groups involved. This Solving this data integration challenge can't be on the backs of any one stakeholder group. So I'd like us all to take a step and just imagine a world for a second through the lens of each of these stakeholder groups where this is actually working. So take a moment and put yourselves in the shoes of countries and imagine a world where they have a complete immunization picture leading to higher cold chain uptime and higher immunization coverage while achieving data sovereignty. So they no longer have to worry about who has access to what data and who is it being shared with. Next, put yourselves in the feet of funding and procurement stakeholders, where they would like to know that there are robust CCE options and monitoring options on the market. Uh, and those are achieving high uptime so that they can be confident that they are spending donor dollars wisely. On the supplier front, put yourselves in the shoes of suppliers and imagine a world where country integrations actually support a positive business case rather than represent a risk to their businesses. And finally, put yourselves in the shoes of regulators where if specs can be informed by data and performance gaps are being addressed, they can be confident that the performance of equipment is moving forward over time. 
Now, these are lofty goals, um, but I'm confident that these, this, this is possible. And I'm an engineer, I come from a very technical organization, and it's very tempting to think of this as purely a technical problem, where we just need to get some bits of data from some systems into some other systems. And as we've been working on this and hearing stories from various stakeholders, it's become very clear that this isn't just a technical problem. And I would say even the primary problems aren't technical. The hard part is to avoid putting the entire burden for this onto one of those single stakeholder groups that we talked about on the prior slide. This has to work for everybody. But it is solvable if we all focus in on prioritizing country needs, what is maximum, what it provides the maximum utility for countries, and acknowledging that suppliers must have a positive business case for that to be sustainable moving forward. So what will it take to solve this? Here's a suggested roadmap for what we might do to achieve these data integrations. First, the cold chain data has to have somewhere to go. So there have to be robust country systems, dashboards, reporting systems, LMIS systems that are set up to receive data from numerous different sources. The upcoming EMS specifications from PQS help with this so that there are common ways for cold chain data to flow. But I'd position this as a call to action to suppliers. Can you develop systems that can pull data in from numerous sources, not just the logging equipment that you might have developed and have deployed to date? Okay, so now that we have those systems available, we need to get data to those systems. And this is where we need to provide a pattern for efficient data integration so that we're not putting the burden on countries and suppliers to figure out how to integrate every system with every other system, because that becomes enormously resource intensive. So a pattern could exist where suppliers deliver data into a country interoperability layer, and from there, countries can route data to any downstream system that they may choose either now or in the future, so that they have flexibility to add data consumers or to change out data consumers without having to burden the suppliers upstream with those data integration tasks. Okay, so now we have data moving from the suppliers to unified country systems. The next step is to align incentives for viability. First, coming back to this business case point, suppliers both on the upstream side, monitoring providers, must have a positive business case for shipping data into some country systems or an interoperability layer. And on the downstream side, if there's ELMIS systems being built out or unified cold chain management portals, those have to have a constant funding stream and mobilization of country resources has to be possible to continue paying the bills for those systems as well. And critically, these kinds of systems implemented will bring more cold chain problems to the forefront. There are problems out there that just aren't well enough seen right now. And that's a good thing. These problems already exist and we'll have a better sense of where they are, but I would put I would suggest that we address those challenges collaboratively rather than punitively. We can all work together to solve the problems of the cold chain because we're all working towards a common goal here. If we can achieve those things, countries will finally be in the driver's seat to fully leverage the value of their cold chain data. And the necessary pieces exist here. It just involves mobilizing the right resources. People, the funding, the technology, and critically the processes for data review and driving action as a result of that data. And I'm confident that there's a path here that could work for all of the stakeholder groups involved, but don't take my word for it. I would encourage everybody to, over the next couple of days, talk to each other and understand what the needs and concerns are from each of these groups and how we might forge a path together here. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, everyone. We do have time for questions. Um, and as they're getting the mics and, and moving that around, uh oh, backwards. Um, a couple things that I noted from this. First off, thanks everyone. This is, I, I geek out on cold chain. I think this is awesome because there are so many um, similarities across the countries and across from PQS. And I feel like we got the full spectrum from the specs guys, remember to review the specs, to where this can go. And, those, and also from the country, really practical experiences on challenges that are similar and successes that are similar. And a couple things that really just popped out for me is when Paul said that we are a chain and that if one of the links breaks, then the whole thing breaks, right? And this is a collective thing. And then Brian, you just, I think, said it really well that this is not just a technical issue. And I think that from Kenya, Tanzania, and Senegal was really well documented that you can put a device, but it's everything else that you have to throw in there. It's the change management, it's getting people in to actually use the data. And then from that, what we're seeing is that when you start seeing challenges with cold chain equipment, you have to, and because RTM brings that, 
you have to change your processes and your policies and your SOPs. And so it's a, it's a, it's a group effort for sure. Um, I don't see any hands yet. Do we have a microphone? All right, we got one yes. here. Um, morning, everyone. Ubas Nachiotoni here from Crown Agents. Um, really appreciate the presentations. Um, very beautiful insights. Um, I did have one particular question, I think, to Yasmin. Um, when I was looking at the graphs which were presented across three countries in Kenya, um, I didn't. I didn't. Um, I just really couldn't help but notice that the dips and the trials were kind of similar. Um, in in um, I think between quarter three to quarter to quarter three to quarter two, 2023. And it just, um, uh, while I was sitting there, it just like demonstrated what has been, what's been discussed around in terms of um, it's it not just being an app, but so many other background factors in terms of the human-centered design which you try to approach um, and how all these factors um, contribute to um, any form of effectiveness of any technology that's being introduced. So it would be good to um, probably throw in more light where, why those um, deep trials were kind of similar um, and maybe probably what happened in those instances. And if it's really tied to HR, there may be some more light um, into capacity building and other efforts could actually be thrown into that. Thanks. Thank you so much for the question. So this is when, it's when we had those dips and troughs and we started noticing them, or the, the team started noticing them, that I think they started doing the root cause and that's when they identified that it was probably waves of FT2 devices expiring. And that's, that's why they look so similar because the context of those three counties is very different. So it's probably not a trend in HR related issues or anything else. That's when we started noticing, I think. And it took a while to pinpoint what the issue was, but eventually that's what it was. Uh, okay, th okay. Th thank you. Um, good morning and congratulations for all the presentation. It was very inspiring. I have a question for you, more particularly Suleiman in Senegal. My name is Zora Silip from Ganeshade. We are supporting also the Senegal team on Coach to Pay, as you know. And uh, for the, I think the question is also for the other colleagues, but I know better uh, Senegal case. Um, one critical point, I think, regarding the digitalization, I would say, of, uh, you know, monitoring the, the temperature and all these things, I was thinking about interoperability. Uh, we understand that uh, at country level, the governments, they don't have much, um, 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 many human resources for health, for the API is worse, for cold chain is worse than, and so on. So what is currently the conversation with uh, the different uh, partners, with the government to ease the work of the, of, the, of the Minister of Health managing multiple apps? I think it's important, digitalization is key, it's very important. Uh, the modernization is good, but then the the way to manage the different KPI, as you mentioned, and right? there are multiple KPIs for performance of the human resources, for the cold chain, for the uh, ELMIs, which is logistics in, uh, in in Senegal. So where are we, <laughs> and what is the plan for making uh, the business easier for for the human resources? Thank you. Yeah, thank you to see, to put a face to the name. So, yeah, thank you. And I didn't mention it because I think that what we did in Senegal also, we were able to use our uh, deck, <coughs> training deck on Ganesh Aid web uh, app. Ganesh Aid has been working with the API team to, you know, provide tools for training, you know, using the app. So thank you for doing that. And it's being used. I can speak for what I know. I know that about a month ago, with support from CHAI and I think UNICEF and, uh, and other development partner and PATH, they had a retreat in TS with the Department of the Digital Health in the Ministry to really look at everything and what's feasible. I think that's the process. But you remember we started talking about integration like four years ago. Never, we didn't have a driver. <coughs> <'Cause> the, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> the EPI team could not drive the whole ministry wide. So now I think that there is a, uh, yeah, there is a will. Now there's somebody that can be driving. Now are we going to move beyond just the good intentions? I, I don't know. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, that, can I? Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Ridwan. I'm from UNICEF EAPRO. 
Brian, I, I totally agree with you, but this is not technical uh, issue. This is a governance system in terms of uh, interoperability. Because I think this is some, you know, I remember the, the, the phase where we, there was a lot of pilot. We call it pilotitis. There's a lot of uh, pilot. This is including not only in LMIS, we also have a, a electronic immunization registry. So I think this is a governance system which need to be solved globally. That we need to talk to each other. That how are we going to solve this issue? Because there are so many systems deployed at the country level, they couldn't talk to each other. The problem is, for example, uh, a simple one. Not uh, the, the remote temperature monitoring device is much more complicated. Inventory system. There's so many inventory system. At the at the burden to to who? Health workers. They need to do a lot of uh, uh, update because that continue changes. And then those LMIS inventory system, they couldn't talk to each other. I think we need to solve this issue. Uh, the electronic emergency registry, we have a standard, the FHIR. They deploy resources for all software developers to, to make sure they can talk to each other. I think we also need to have this as well at the global level. I think uh, we are, I think we are, the cost of this is basically the health workers. You know, there's a lot of burden to the health workers. They have to, you know, use different system. Uh, for me, I'm, you know, uh, as a user, I'm a technologically blind. Blind. There's no brand for me. For me, any brands, as long as they can talk to each other, where the health workers can use one system and the central level can also use one system, I think that's probably the, the, the aiming we need to go. If we don't solve it now, we're going to have more and more system def, uh, deploy. I, I, you know, last time on the electronic immunization registry as well, we have different hospitals have different systems. And I think this is a plea for everybody, for supplier, for Gavi, UNICEF, WHO at global level. We need to start having a governance system so we can solve the interoperability of many systems. I, uh, I think you have the roadmap. Maybe we just need to you know, make it. How are we going to, to, to make it real? Thank you. Thanks for that comment. Okay, great. Can I just, just, just two points. I was kind of uh, intrigued by Zig uh, asked uh, how many people know what PQS is uh, in their hall, from, particularly from the government. And I think this is a problem that we see in country. Many people don't actually know what uh, PQS is, what pre-qualified equipment is. And it's, it's a problem. I remember sometime in 2015, Gavi uh, did a study in 55 countries and actually established that just about 20% of facilities have a PQS equipment. And we did an inventory in Cameroon and the results were kind of uh, similar. Uh, but I think since then, uh, things have changed, uh, particularly with the institution of CCOP. We have seen the proportion of facilities using uh, pre-qualified equipment improve. But the challenge we face is that countries have multiple ways of having coaching equipment from uh, bilateral donors, from uh, elites, and so on. So I think the communication, the WHO and uh, the PQS department, you need to actually do a lot, particularly sensitizing those uh, uh, um, different key holders on the importance of having coaching equipment. I don't know how you are going to do that, but I think it's absolutely important. The second point is we, they, we get pre-qualified uh, equipment uh, introduced into, system, into public health systems, but the challenge is that we don't always have a mechanism to do some sort of a post-marketing surveillance to know how this code, uh, these uh, equipments are doing over time. So is there any plan to institute such a system, be it for refrigerators, be it for temperature monitoring devices and all other uh, uh, equipments that are pre-qualified? And if yes, what is the mechanism? What will be the responsibility of countries uh, and the responsibilities of uh, uh, partners as well as uh, frontline immunization healthcare workers? Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Yaoba. I think you, you are really spot on there in terms of um, the communication that we need to do to make sure that countries are aware of the service we provide and also that um, the equipment which are pre-qualified are more adapted to uh, the socioeconomic situation of these countries. Um, I think we've done some strides over the past five years in terms of communication, but we still have uh, much more to do. And we call on everyone here, it's not only Paul and myself who are going to do that, 
But I think um, everyone here should uh, be a, a messenger for this, uh, for this uh, news. Um, maybe for PMM, I'll ask Paul to, to talk something about. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, getting detailed uh, performance feedback uh, is difficult. Um, again, like the communications, we're, we're hungry to receive detailed, actionable feedback on performance issues from equipment. Uh, the reason that we wanted is um, if we could identify that the, the issue is based on a specification, we're owners of the specs, so that's easier for us to identify to improve the equipment. And if it is a genuine quality performance issue, our, our aim is to work with the manufacturers to solve it as quickly as possible uh, so that the the quality of the equipment improves for all of the countries. Uh, we uh, ran a pilot post-market monitoring uh, project ju just as COVID started. Um, it was based on a Sentinel uh, monthly zero reporting and it worked. Uh, we got actionable feedback and it's led to some revisions to our specs and to some improvements uh, in the equipment. We hope we will be launching in about five countries in the near future to expand that. But a, a request would be to everybody, especially the country representatives, is when you have a, an equipment issue, please write to Paul, Isaac, and especially Lauren, whose email address was there, our, our project manager. So with as much information as you can give us. Thank you. Um, I am, thank you very much, everyone. And I'm afraid we're out of time. If I don't cut this off, Dan is going to yell at me. Um, the coffee break is next. I believe it's been moved into the manufacturer marketplace space. So you can actually talk to these uh, uh, manufacturers of cold chain and, and RTM devices and continue to ask more questions about them. Please join me with a huge thank you for all the presenters here and all the work you're doing.